it would seem that in pre-Christian times, <coughs> in the holy area of Jerusalem, just outside Jerusalem, in the valley of Hinnom, there was something very different from what the Lord wanted here on earth and for which he had formed the chosen people of Israel. <coughs> Not worship of him at all, but of his enemy. And that child sacrifice was practiced there. The firstborn being put through the fire, Satan being placated, lest bad luck come, and that the crops might be fruitful, all religion gone wrong. Indeed, the word Gehenna and Hinnom come to mean hell, and it would seem the devil worship is as old as the hills. It has not gone away. And the devil, of course, is a loser, big time. And he knows it. So all he can do is play acts of spite, vengeance, and complete hatred, jealousy, and envy. <coughs> And so he will try to get his vengeance through gaining as many as possible for his kingdom. And he knows that the incarnation was the means of our salvation through leading to the cross, for the incarnation was in view of the cross. And he knows that the master left not a club on earth, but that he founded a church and gave it his own power. So he has always wanted to eliminate the operation of this power. And over various lands, he has a remarkable success. One thinks of what happened already in North Africa, after the time of the likes of St. Augustine, who was a great light for the church in a very dynamic church. First of all, by weakening that church through the Donatist split, which made it then less able to resist when it came to the Islamic invasion and the destruction that followed. Whole chunks lost. And then one thinks of division within the church the great split of 1054. It didn't take away grace, for grace went with the sacraments, and the sacraments went also into those churches that split away from the centre of unity. But then one thinks of the great victory when it came to the Protestant Reformation, when actually sacramental grace was lost. And one has but to compare in detail the texts that came out of the changes in the liturgy in the 1500s in England to see how deliberately anything to do with the real presence was being attacked. And so it was. It was attacked. And to this day, the sacraments are not fully present in great chunks of Christianity. Who is responsible? We know who is responsible. But then now, in our time, we have the infiltration that has come to fruition. One has been made aware of how priests were being formed in numbers, well-formed, well-groomed, to go through the system and work for the wrong side. And we know how they were to get to the top, that is, as far as possible to the top, as bishops and cardinals. <coughs> It's now no secret what happened, and we see the fruits of it. And now we see how it's coming to fruition in the internal disputes 
and internal divisions and the attack on the doctrine. Now what is interesting in recent times is that the devil has been obliged under pressure and duress to admit certain things. And he has been admitting, yes, that his best friends right now are priests and theologians who are doing his work for him, pushed by him and inspired by him. Isn't he clever? And we know right now what's going on in Germany. One faithful Dutch bishop has spoken out. It's Bishop Robert Wutzertz. What is becoming increasingly clear is, he says, that the synodal process is going to be used to change a number of ecclesiastical views. It's being manipulated by throwing the Holy Spirit into the fray as a lawyer, it would seem, to defend polygamous and LGBTQ plus relationships, even though the Holy Spirit has breathed something quite contrary over the centuries. In other words, the Holy Spirit now is one amongst equals. It's rather a deflation of what we have in the Acts of the Apostles. It does seem good to the Holy Spirit and to us. That's what comes through from the First Council, that of Jerusalem. Only this time the Holy Spirit has to follow what men think. And it would seem that if we're not careful, they're going to allow that to happen. We must be careful. Among the protagonists, he says, of this process are a little too many defenders of same-sex marriage, people who don't really consider abortion a problem and never really show themselves defenders of the rich faith of the Church, who mainly want to be liked by their secular environment. Does that sound vaguely familiar? To be liked by their secular environment. If a priest talks out now, he will find that he has to be careful. Not so much because of what the media might say, because that's expected, but from what might be said from other believers. Hmm. On whose side are we fighting? He slams synodal experts for listening to those who do not agree with the teachings of the Catholic Church and drawing up a list of complaints as the basis of the working document which was presented at the end of October in the Vatican. Now all this to say that we can see that certain things come through in all these attempts to, to weaken the means of grace and their efficacy. Is fecit cui protest. He did it to whom it serves. And Satan has been obliged to admit the same, directly and indirectly. And it is in recent times that we have this curious event at Loreto. It is in the year 2017 that a good and holy priest, an exorcist, was there on the way back from Medjugorje and he happened to have with him two ladies. One was 14 and one was 23. And it would seem that there was demonic presence there. For when he took them into the holy house, it all broke loose. And other priests, first of all, began to pray and then pleaded with the exorcist to demand that the demon be silent because of the disruption it was causing. And he actually obeyed, and then the howls ceased and a conversation took place, which was all recorded well. We have the transcript of it in perfectly coherent Italian, some of which contains ugly language which the devil is not shy to use. So I pass over some of the expletives and I just get to the essence of it. He was obliged to admit that he hated being there, he couldn't bear being there. Why should he be brought in there? And 
course, why? <laughs> it was the very place. It would seem that his brother, Gabriel, had been there, and he was actually present at that moment, it would seem, too. And of course, they had been, Gabriel still was, of the seraphic choir, and so had been Lucifer. And it came out. Yes, it was the true house, and so much had happened there. The walls were full of grace and prayer. Each tiny dust particle was precious, and the whole tiny edifice was far more precious than even the Vatican itself in its structure. And he poked fun at his friends, the theologians, who were so clever and were able to be mani manipulated easily by him. And by so doing, they were able to persuade people not to believe. And indeed, he pointed out how thick they were. He used very interesting terms, mongoloid thoughts, and he indicated that even research would show that it corresponded exactly, because apparently if one places it where it should be, in the Holy Land, there it would fit perfectly. The joints of the walls would fit in, just as it was. I think there may be one part of it still there to indicate. Anyway, he went on to show how he had tried to destroy the work of the Incarnation immediately through inspiring his faithful servant, he says, Herod, to do his work for him. And of course it failed. And he goes on to talk about the way that that slaughter of the innocents, of which we think on this day, 28th of December, added to his own pain, that of Satan, because he was responsible for it, pushing Herod, and that he took it out on Herod. And of Herod, of course, <laughs> he said, was with him in his house. And also he goes on in the same exorcism to indicate how his kingdom he got because precisely he would not go along with what was being shown them. This is in pre-time. They were being shown a, a pan creature that he would have to adore, the Son of God and also this lady. And all the others, of course, went along with it, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't ever adore something of a lower degree. And of course it was instant. And this battle took place. Huge cosmic battle in the universe before we were even thought about. And so there this took place, and he admits that he created his kingdom. Hell began to exist as far as possible from his maker. And of course these angels there. And we know also from what people have seen, Veronica Giuliani and people of this nature, that people who go to serve him in his kingdom after death become like him, and they can become bestial in form. They resemble him, and even in this life there are certain resemblances in the way they act. Envy, hatred, even violence in the face. One can detect a person who is not serving the right side. And he insists how that place is at the antipodes. He can't pronounce the name of Mary. He can't pronounce the word fiat. The priest has to pronounce it for him. This is precisely the word of surrender. And our blessed lady is the purest. And he actually, in negative, indicates how pure and utterly holy she is. He just can't bear her. And he knows that she has a fearful power against him. As so we see, of course, how he tries to get the rosary out of the hands of the simple people. And make sure it's not said, or said badly if it is. But he goes on to indicate how, in history, he had tried his best to destroy this house, which was so holy. There were many angels serving the Blessed Virgin. 
the purity and holiness of the house. Joseph was also there, and he talks about Joseph, the one with the beard. <laughs> and uh, you can't use these names. And then he goes on to say how he used the Islamic attack to destroy these sacred places. He even uses the word, my servants, the Muslims. They were doing his work for him. Destruction, destruction. But then he goes on to our own times and how his servants now are clever theologians. And he makes fun of them. They don't know they're being led. But now we can see how that is right before us. Highly educated heads in church circles are doing right now what Satan wants to be done. Divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. True to his own name, Diabolus. Via through and volein is to shatter, attack, bash, all that. It's there. Divide. He is the divider. So, back to where I started. In pre-Christian times, for good luck's sake, they would sacrifice children, the firstborn, to Satan in the valley of Hinnom. And right now, every abortion, it would seem, releases more demons into the air. It's all power for the wrong side. Indirectly, it's a sacrifice to the same. And so also, subtly, Satan is being well served. People don't realize that by being clever, they're being hoodwinked by one who is even more clever. Some years ago in Rome, I was listening to what people had to say about an exorcism that had taken place. The demons had been obliged by the exorcist to go, go to the pit of hell, go all together. And the demons answered, we're never together. We're all alone. In other words, where people are lost, and where demons are roaming together, they are not at all at all together. Communion and union is angelic by nature, and so is harmony. Disharmony and separation is from the other side. The church has to be in symphony. There is a cacophony, and each shouts loudly his own thing and doesn't sing from the same hymn sheet. So disunity is an excellent fruit of hell. So I wrote this when hearing what the demons had said. Exorcism. There is somewhere a pain beyond the world of sense, whence none returns to share a thought of ghostliness untold. Yet in this word of eloquence demonic, quite unsought, but given twixt grinding teeth, I see a sound of raging incandescent where there is no more a moment's cooling to be found or company but fellowship all his together go together None may be. Go thither, with a God prepared a place. No God made this, created it, have we, and for much loneliness there is much space. And there are some that burn 
as I read on and on and on on beamed glories. God